Hello and welcome to another edition of the Jiu Jitsu Oracle, where we are going to talk about the Rotos. Who are we? I'm Ross. That's Callum. We're training together at SVG Aberdeen. This is an in person podcast for those watching on YouTube in our little studio at the gym. Um, before we go any further, please like, subscribe, follow, spread the love. Let other people know about the Jiu-Jitsu Oracle if you enjoy what we're doing, where we're trying to review and preview all the big shows in Jiu-Jitsu. So the most recent of which was one in fighting championship, where they had a mixed card full of different combat sports and the Jiu-Jitsu portion of the card saw Cain Rotolo submit Francisco Lowe. Callum's nodding away here, so I know I'm getting it right. And Ty Rotolo, his brother, submit Isaac Michel. Both hit the same submission, which is now being called the Rotolo team. The sort of arm in, rear naked choke from the back. Both looked super impressive. Callum, tell us your thoughts on their performances, please. Yeah, two really good matches. I um, was quite interested by the, the one with Ty and Isaac, just because Ty's style we usually see in wrestling and one play passing and I think in his division Isaac's got some of the best wrestling in that division so I was quite interested to see how that would go and um, it was quite competitive on the feet um, until the last exchange where Ty hit quite a cool switch into like a scissor sweep sort of thing into mount and then from there kind of controlled the rest of the match and got the back and got to that uh, interesting submission from the back and then Cade Managed to get his opponent to roll from when he was passed and then again took the back and got that sub something. Okay, so we in this podcast are going to give five reasons or five categories why we think the Rotolos are so good. And then we're going to give our Noogie's Brobo rankings where we're going to rank five prominent brothers in Noogie's Jiu-Jitsu and say who we think is currently numero uno. So, first, on the Rotolos, I would say the first category that makes them so good is their well-roundedness. What do you think? Yeah, I'd agree with that. Typically, in their competition game, like like I said, they don't seem much outside of their kind of wrestling and passing, but they are definitely well-rounded when we see them go up their back. They're quite comfortable there, even if it's just looking to stand up. Good defensively. Um, as we saw with like Ty against Josh Hinger when he was putting some tight spots, he was able to uh, work his way out of that, even though he did lose that match and obviously amazing wrestling and passing as well. So when we had our chat with friend of the show, William Tackett, he talked about his current desire and why he's striving to be as well-rounded as he possibly can. And I think for... A wee while now, the Rotolos have had that in their game. There's no area where you can kind of take them that you're going to have a distinct edge. So I think, and it's super impressive for people that young to be that well-rounded. But I think it is now necessary at the elite level to be well-rounded. Yeah. Calum agrees. So, because we had that spell of specialists being able to have success... But I think when you look at the guys that are like at the top end, like the Rotolos, in order to beat them, I don't think they're going to be fooled by a specialist. I think you're going to have to be willing to wrestle them, have to be willing to enter the legs, have to be willing to play a bit of guard against their passing, etc. in order to come out on top. So, one of the reasons why we're doing this as well is to give insight into how we can all get better. Right, So you look at the Rotolos and you think, well, why are they so good? Here's five areas that makes them excel, or we can take that into our training. So that's something we're working on, right? Is try to be as well-rounded a grappler as we possibly can. What are you working on on that aspect? Um, so you might have uh, seen on my story getting tagged on some uh, poor wrestling exchanges this morning, so something I'm trying to get better at. It's a bit of a weakness for me, so try to round it. Yeah, and then you did some escapes today. Yeah, some guards, some passing, some escapes, some uh, stuff from standing, so hitting all, eight, all areas today. Yeah, just try to stay on top of everything, right? So then, I think, talking about wrestling, 
that leads into, I think, the next section why I think Cade and Ty are so exceptional, and that's that their movement matches their morphology and their personality. So I think when you see them on their feet, they're quite willing to like press forward, look for underhooks, clubs, dominance, but also they're willing to play a little bit more bladed, look for overhooks, turn to the side, you know, look for foot sweeps. I think the way they move on their feet blends really well with their personalities and what their bodies are capable of. Yeah, I think uh, going back to the well-roundedness as well for that point, I think their well-roundedness in like submission attacks uh, makes people somewhat hesitant to shoot in for certain um, attacks. Obviously, their Dorfs is probably what they're best well-known for, so that's quite available a lot of the time when people shoot in on them. And then we've seen some ridiculous stuff like uh, Cade versus PG Barch when PG was getting the better of the wrestling and Cade managed to pull an armbar out of nowhere. So I think that helps their stand-up as well, even though they're just pure takedowns are really good from there as well. Yeah, I do think, sorry, uh, Pedro Mourinho makes me think of this. Having a move that's a great equaliser, you think you're doing great, you're in on them, then all of a sudden the guillotine comes out of nowhere and it's like, oh, I'm now on the defensive. Um, so I do agree, like that threat of that Dars is uh, such a, a bonus for the Rotolos. But I think like the go-between as well, like um, sort of like aggressive movements to like sporty movements on the feet as well. Like almost like you can see that sort of like surfing vibe as they blade off to the side. But then at other times they're willing to like push forward and um, try and get attachments on the, the shoulders and the head. So I think like their movement and their morphology, their movement matches their morphology and their personality. Also it ties into their passing as well. They're yeah. Like pinning the legs, staying away and not getting entangled and moving around the outside, which is easier because they've got so much distance to kind of control the legs, do those kind of secret passing around to north-south. Yeah, and I think that's an important point to emphasize is that you're in jiu-jitsu, in submission grappling, kind of, I wouldn't say in a phrase it's all the same, right? So if the way you move on your feet to wrestle is totally different to the way you're trying to move on your feet to pass, I would say there's probably some issues there. Because really, like how you move on your feet should be the best way that you can move on your feet, and your passing should probably have a similar vibe to your wrestling, and vice versa. And I think like Cade and Ty do that. Um, so the next fra- phase we'll get into is their short reaction time. So it's very difficult to out maneuver them with speed um, a great example of that would be like uh, Cade and Mika in the final of the ADCC where Cade managed to catch the submission but I never really see them in her uh, sequence and get out maneuvered with speed yeah I think it's uh, obviously they are very athletic and fast physically but I think more than anything it's their like mind's speed. Like if they're in like a sort of scrambly scenario, they just seem to be able to see something in a split second and jump in it. Like we've spoken about with Mika in the past, it's just like any split second they can jump on something and that's the match over. And um, probably just because of how long they've been training. But I think that ties into what you were saying. They're quite flowy and then they're intense. I think if you go into a match and you're just like kind of tensed up and intense you're probably gonna miss a lot of those like split second opportunities that they manage to jump on so they're quite relaxed but then as soon as they see an opportunity which is given to them because they're so relaxed and they can take everything in then they become super intense and aggressive with it i think that was interesting like i say the parallel between mika and ty uh, or kid when we saw ty versus mika like, they were both quite tentative uh, ty was getting to his passing position he was quite tentative to close the distance because Mika's got that ability as well. And then it was interesting to see Cade versus Mika. Um, and then Cade managed to come out on top in that sort of situation where you just spent a split second. But I do think that could have went either way. But yeah, just their ability to stay relaxed, react to things. I kind of like to say in the matrix a little bit. They're just able to like mentally judge what's going on a lot quicker than everyone else and just jump on whatever they see in a split second. And before guys really know what's happened to them, they're in one of these submissions and usually that after the match. It's their subconscious 
Yeah, you can never really think that fast. Like, obviously, you've got positions in jiu-jitsu where it's a bit more static than you can think. Maybe, like, chest-to-chest half bar on top or, like, having someone's back. You've got time to, like, think about stuff, but you need stuff drilled into yourself. Self. I think there's a phrase my coach uses. I don't know if it's a phrase that he's picked up from other coaches. Um, but it's uh, in jiu-jitsu you're early or late you're never on time and I think the rituals are always early and then so if you enter an exchange with them they're going to get ahead in it and then you're going to be trying to catch them up and like it's a, and then if you end up in a darse choke like you know you're not catching them up anymore Yeah. but they do seem to be very good at getting early to the next bit of the exchange rather than being in that phase where they're always reactionary, very quickly it like changes. Um, they seem to be getting quicker in that regard as well. So I'd say that's just their jiu-jitsu improving and evolving. But that ma- that two matches with uh, Tommy Langacker, I think uh, Cade uh, had <coughs> looked like even quicker, even slicker, even more switched on the second time around. Yeah, and it'll be interesting, I think, um, to see how their game evolves. Obviously, they've still got quite a few years of being able to do that, but um, I think I've seen Gordon quote as saying, your game needs to move from like a movement style um, to like a control-based style as you get older, and your reactions do slow down a bit. So I'd like to see if they're still on the grappling scene like in their early 30s, if that is going to be adjusted, because they're probably not going to have the same level of reactions as their uh, opponents, so they might have to play a slightly different game, but right now they're playing into their strengths and it's really working out for them. Yeah, so we've got, thus far, well-roundedness. We've got their movement matching their body types and their personalities. We've got the speed of their reactions or their subconscious driving their grappling. Now we're going to talk about area number four, which is their cardio long endurance, long kinetic chains that they're able to go into. So, Cam, tell us about that, please. Yeah, so they've got amazing cardio. Obviously, they've trained for the longest time, so they're obviously going to be very efficient. They're literally, their whole body's, like, grown and morphed around doing jiu-jitsu, and they've been doing it since, like, three, four years old. So that's obviously going to help, but physically, super fit as well, like, doing jiu-jitsu all the time, surfing all the time. Um, And we see that in their matches. They've got a ridiculous pace that they can kind of maintain through the whole match and obviously they've got the efficiency side of it but I also see them like gritting their faces and looking like they're putting max effort in and then coming out of that exchange and like they're still fine um, I think the match that highlights that to me the most was Ty versus Merigali at the absolutes for ADCC so some like ridiculous scrambles the whole match and I think we went to overtime I can't remember exactly how long the match went something probably in the vicinity of 20 minutes and um, obviously Ty with a massive weight disadvantage as well. He was still able to keep the pace going the whole match and that was keeping him in the match, I think, against Mirigali. I think uh, their passing shows their ability to like put these long chains together over long periods of time that tires their partner. Not Not only because they can be passing in a way that really gives you an ab workout and um, but also it's like the just yeah, just the length of time they can keep it going for is super impressive. Yeah, and it kinda of leads back into the last point as well. Like when they do tire the guy out a lot of the time, that's when you'll see them starting to like make mistakes, overextending and framing, that's when they can jump on Darces or whatever they kinda of see in that split second while the guy's overextended a little bit because he's sick of just lying at his back, pulling his legs, getting tired out throughout the match. Yeah. Then then Lachlan Giles maybe Overextend in one moment. Yeah, um, yeah, just for a split second. Yeah, or south position. I think same thing with uh, Diego Pato when he had a match with uh, Cade in that one fifty five. Who's number one tournament? Guard retention was looking really good throughout the match. He got a really good arm bar attempt on Cade, but towards the end of the match, obviously pretty tiring dealing with that throughout the whole match. So you saw Pato extend, and then he got caught in a door. So these things can happen over and over again in these matches with these guys. Yeah. And then, I think area number five, we kind of touched on it in terms of it. I, I don't know them, so I'm just making observations on what their personality types might be and how that affects their jiu-jitsu. 
But I would say that there's definitely like a playfulness and fun element to the Rotolos. But there's also a savagery and a grit as well. And I think if you could have that dynamic, if you could have that a, a balance between the two in your training, that will really help. Like I don't think you can do loads of jiu-jitsu over a long period of time if you don't have that playful and fun element. But probably at the same time, you're not going to be able to do jiu-jitsu for ages if you don't have that gritty element that really gets you through. And definitely if you're a competitor, you need that savage element. So when there's a submission, you're able to really walk onto it and get the win. Yeah, especially like coming up for competitions, I think. If you've got a bit of a off-season, let's say, where you're not competing, that's the time personally when I like to play, be like super playful, play in the positions I'm not really used to. And then um, if there's a call coming up for the two weeks leading up to that, literally any opportunity I see to jump on something, I will take that because I think it becomes a bit of a habit. So if you spend a few months kind of doing that playful style of training where you're letting stuff happen and um, letting yourself get put in bad positions and not necessarily taking like whatever options given to you because you want to work other stuff, that can become a bit of a habit. So if you do that and then go straight into a comp, you might miss out with some opportunities that are presented to you. So I like to get a couple of weeks before that and just take any single opportunity because you don't want to be in a match and an opportunity arises, then you're kind of in this like sluggish sort of mode and you miss out on those opportunities. I think playfulness leads to innovation as well. Yeah. And we have seen the Rotolos evolve and innovate and change over time. I think that only comes from being able to be exploratory. Um, if you're just on it trying to hit what you're good at already, you're going to stunt your growth. Um, but in terms of people who are able to finish when they get a look at something, I'd say they're among the best in the world. Like it's very rare when you see them get towards a choke in particular that anyone's getting out of it. Yeah. So they've got that what I'll call savagery to finish. Um, and yeah, like you've mentioned before, the grit, you know, Ty versus Merigali is a great example of that, but they're not going to quit. I say with uh, Ty versus Josh Hinger, even though he lost that match, you can see like for like minutes at a time, he was just grimacing, like putting 100% effort in um, the whole time and try to get out and never like mentally giving up or breaking in that match. It's so hard to deal with when you compete against someone like that just feels like I've won dives <laughs> please just take a backward step but no they just keep coming they just keep coming so five reasons think well-roundedness movement matching morphology slash personality in all areas of the game go back to well-roundedness but your wrestling should look like you're passing etc uh speed of reaction really getting your subconscious to drive your jiu-jitsu long kinetic chains and building your cardio around that and then, um, yeah, that personality dynamic where you've got a playful side and you've got a more savage side. So I think that's five reasons, areas why they are so good. But we had a little chat before we did the podcast, before we hit the record button. And Callum suggested that uh, there's, a, there's another reason that's not accessible to everyone necessarily as to why their toes might be as good as they are. Yeah, so I think in jiu-jitsu... So uh, you kind of see so many high level grapplers that are brothers or even better twins. So obviously I can't really name every example off my head, but like the Estimas, the Meows, the Mendes brothers, all these kind of guys and some present guys that we're going to talk about. There we go. Um, I was just worried you were going to give away the rank no, no, no. everyone's staying tuned in for. Yeah, uh, giving some uh, past names a little bit of the limelight. But yet, yeah, see this almost diff proportionately i would i would suggest compared to other sports and i think it's just that ability to train with your brother or sibling um, or twin whenever you like and like any i think a lot of guys that are really pushing to get better in the sport or like have ideas come to them and they'll be okay i'll, I'll wait till tonight and i'll try that out if you're at home with your brother you can just grab them whenever you want and um, and try that out you can go through a whole dvd or like problem solve things literally all day at like a kind of low pace so you can do that all day long and there's like that competitive element where you always want to be trying to get better than your brother so I think all these things play a big role in why we see so many siblings doing really well in Jiu Jitsu so that's good that you mentioned siblings 
because we could have a brother sister Tom and Mikey and we could have however people identify being in dynamic as well so if you've got a close relative yeah. that can help I think in <laughs> jinjitsu although we do see some uh, siblings where there is a big difference in body shape it can be very helpful to have someone who's around about yeah. your weight yeah there's a lot of twins and a lot of guys like he and Hafa who aren't twins but are very similar in size because if you look at a lot of professional sports um, there are younger siblings who have reached a higher level than their elder sibling and there's a theory that they've been playing with the elder sibling throughout time and that's brought their level up so but in football you don't have the same physicality as in jiu-jitsu so if there's like a two three four year age gap and a big difference in body type um, it might be that you just get big brothered it doesn't really matter how good your jiu-jitsu is <laughs> yeah so if you can have that dynamic where you're able to play with each other, that will really help. Now, I did say that it's not accessible to everyone to have a symbol in as you're growing up that uh, is able to do jiu-jitsu with you. But we then extended our idea to having a jiu-jitsu brother or sister. And I think that does happen in gyms where you start at roughly the same time as someone or maybe one's a bit less experienced, one's a bit more experienced, but you've got this dynamic where you're like working well together and sort of like you, let's just say, go through the ranks kind of at the same time, but you're like pushing each other on, you're developing one thing, they're trying to counter it, they start getting better at something, you try and counter it. Having that dynamic can be really healthy. Yeah, that's an interesting point. Obviously with your training partner as you like, whatever your little game is or your little like subsystems, you tend to go so deep and it with your training partner and you'll maybe learn something new. I'll hit it on you one week, then next week it doesn't work because you've done something and then over the course of a year we're maybe like 20 layers deep into that and then you go into competition and someone's only one or two layers deep into that and you're just going to like smoke them if you get into that position. So it's an interesting point that I'm sure is like exemplified even more by having a sibling. But same thing in jiu-jitsu, I've had guys at certain points that I can... They're always up for training with me, like out training with me outside of class. Obviously, when you're in class, you tend to train with everyone. But um, see you with guys here like uh, Jamie and Ross. I'm say they both work, so they both come in after their work and come in half an hour early and do some stuff. And then you might have guys like me and Ash that are kind of bums and don't really work too much, and we can come in at uh, other times during the day. So it's good having those guys that can come in times you want to train it. Yeah, so it was back to the idea of having like an out of hours yeah. sibling as well. Yeah, because like in class, like you might like to partner up with that person, but generally you're training with everyone and generally you're doing whatever is done in the class. So having your own kind of stuff you're working on outside of class with guys that like to train during that time. So if you're a Rotolo and your brother's right there, super handy. But if you're not, maybe get a sibling in your gym. And yeah, I think that's a good point. Like try and get it out of hours. Because always wearing jiu-jitsu of like little clicks forming and stuff like that and also like you can get too comfortable with someone it's like oh we're doing our little thing and then you just get into those patterns and then someone else comes with a completely different game and it throws you so yeah you do need to train with everyone but i, I do think like having someone that you can like, play back and forward with and will help you push on and that takes us towards smooth segment our brother rankings so we're only looking at no-gi jiu-jitsu for this, so we mentioned on the podcast before um, sort of like some of the brothers who'd excel in, and I'd suggested that uh, Sam and Jackson, the guy, were now right at the top of uh, the bro icons, and then we also mentioned guys playing the gi, the Menezes. Yeah, Saldres. Yeah. That's a few examples. So we're going to leave uh, we, to the side just now. Maybe we'll, we'll revisit this after the, the Worlds and we'll do gi and no gi together. But in the no gi rankings, we'll go five through the one. So number five, Callum, who are we giving that place to? Uh, you've stumped me because we went first to last. So you... Come on, it's your, it's, it's your favourite. Oh, oh the, 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 yeah, the, the Corby brothers. The Corby brothers. Kyle, why do you like the Corby brothers so much? Um, 
I really like watching them, just particularly DeAndre. They've got quite different styles. Gavin's a bit more wild, a bit more movement, like the Rotolos jumping on stuff, and uh, DeAndre's a bit more like systematic and controlled, um, and like syndicate the movement a little bit more. But both obviously really good. We've seen a bit of a breakout for DeAndre, obviously just winning trials the other weekend, but. Previous to that, in a bunch of different shows, they've been doing really well the past year. Um, I don't think their focus has shifted towards ADCC this past year or two, but before that, they had great success in the Nogi IBGGF scene as well, winning some uh, black belt major titles in the Nogi. Um, so, yeah, they are in a defy spot. Just get into the list yeah. in achievement as well. Definitely. So, well done, the Corbys. Number four. Seem you remember who we gave this to. Uh, number four, I believe, were the Tackets. The Tackets. Specifically, William and Andrew. Yeah. Because Caleb's still Develop. developing and coming through. Yeah. Yeah. So talk to us about the Tackets. Yeah. So they are both obviously trials winners now. William twice, as well as a bunch of different podium places at the trials. And uh, Andrew, as well, has just won his first trials. Both amazing grapplers, both had a lot of success in shows as well. William's really active on all different shows, some really notable uh, wins. Andrew as well, um, most kind of crazy win that I've seen is him versus Big Dan um, in the Who's Next show. That was pretty impressive to watch. But yeah, both really amazing grapplers. Looking forward to watching in the ADCC and pretty well accomplished. Yeah, and improving. Yeah, both Ad very young as well. Both young, very kind of similar in that regard to another couple of brothers who we've mentioned before who will obviously be in and around our top three spots but you've got that vibe like the Rotolos young the Tackett's young and both seem mm -hmm. to have all of the qualities that we chatted about um, where we specifically highlighted the Rotolos so number three we have the Rodriguez brothers. So, I think with some of the guys on this list, there's a bit more of a disparity in current achievements between the two brothers and others. I think this is the the case for these two. So, Nicky, obviously, really good achievement. Two-time silver medalist ADCC, which is really amazing achievement. Uh, Jay's a bit younger, especially in the sport. He's only kind of shifted over the past few years, so... So far from him, though, so still, we've seen um, ADCC Trials winner placed at some other ADCC Trials and some great uh, wins here and there on the show, on the kind of sub on the shows. Uh, Nicky Rod, so definitely a lot more uh, accomplished thus far. Um, out of all the guys that have been on the list so far, single-handedly, definitely the most accomplished. So um, because of that, they're at number three. Okay, so there are now two spots left. Yeah. We've not mentioned the Rotolos in our top five yet, so they're obviously still a come. Yeah. And we've not mentioned probably currently the most famous brother duel in grappling yet, the Ryans. So how's this going to shake out? Who gets the silver and who gets the gold? So... The shake-up between these two is kind of uh, what I just mentioned. You've got one set of brothers where um, one of them right now is kind of carrying the other and as far as achievements, one of them's a lot more accomplished than the other. And then the other pair um, are a lot more similar. Um, the peak of one of the brothers is higher than the other two, but the, the other two are more accomplished than the lesser accomplished brother. But I'll stop rambling now and I'll just, I'll just list them off. So we've got the Ryan brothers at number two. Um, obviously, Gordon, consensus, consensus best grappler in the world right now, most accomplished active grappler in the world. Um, and Nicky Ryan, obviously amazing grappler, some great achievements, but uh, nowhere near what Gordon has currently achieved. So I think, what is Gordon at now? Five ADCC golds and a silver, I think. I'll take your word for it. Uh, I think we'll see. We'll cut around. I think one. Multiple. One. In 2017, two in 2019, two in 2021, I think, um, or 22, two, whenever the last one was. But anyway, yeah, obviously could have made a strong argument to put these two in number one just because of how uh, accomplished Gordon is. But I think uh, Nicky in his current achievements is dragging him down a little bit. So we've got those two. In. Dragging down it. It's a bull, bull phrase. I do think you're right, though. Yeah. Like the, the dynamic between two. 
Um, if it's obvious who we've got as number one, if the number one wasn't so accomplished though, like let's just say the Rotolos didn't exist in this ranking yeah. and you had like the Rods, the Tackets, the Corpus and stuff like that. Obviously like, the Ryans would be at number one and like ob- that that would be massively helped by yeah. Gordon's achievements. But it's just that the Rotolos have amazing yeah. achievements and it's spread out more right. between the two. I think there's well, I don't know if this affects where I put them on the list, but quite an interesting point, I think, is that there's the least brotherly relationship um, between the two and the fact that they're like, we spoke about some of these guys are quite different in size, which uh, obviously applies to the Rodriguez brothers as well, applies to the Ryan brothers, but they don't even train with each other anymore um, either. So obviously it's potentially influenced how good they've gotten growing up together. But at this point now, it's not really like a non-factor because they don't train with each other at this moment in time. Yeah, I wonder what I, I have no idea of the dynamic of their training together, their interactions together when they were training at the same gyms, you know, all that time training under John Danaher. Who were Gordon's main training partners, yeah. who were Nikki's main training partners, how often did they train together, etc. It's just a bit more obvious when they were told because there's so much video footage of them training together, yeah. you know. I'm just smiling because uh, it made me think of uh, the supposed backstory of the Ryan brothers. If you can find it um, on one of the Simple Man podcasts, it's quite an entertaining story. Apparently, um, Nicky tells the story, so I'm just taking his word for it. Apparently, they uh, got into grappling via like an after-school club, fight club, and that was started by whoever was looking after them. It sounds like a bit of a mix between like Fight Club and School of Rock, where the the teacher was like shutting off the windows in the classroom and making them do jujitsu against each other. So I mean, you can find that story is quite entertaining. But yeah, Simple Man Podcast. Yeah, okay, check it out. Shout out Simple Man Podcast. Number one, the Rotolos. Yeah, for all the reasons that we've mentioned yeah. in the podcast so far. Yeah, and also, do you want to just touch on some of their personal accolades? That yeah, they've so. Cade obviously won the last um, ADCC World Championships at 77 kilos. Ty, at that same event, um, put out first round in his division, but then went on to get bronze in the absolute, taking out some like monster names like Pedro Barino and Felipe Capena, having that absolute war against Merigali that he lost an arrow decision to. Um, on top of that, Ty is... On paper, the um, Gi world champion of black belt as well. He'd lost the final to Mika, but um, Mika's accolade was taken away um, because of failing a drug test. So um, he is on paper a Gi world champion as well. Also, Ty is a brown belt Gi world champion, beating Cade in the final of that as well. And tons of like sub on the shows over the years as well. So I think the closeness in their achievements... Um, as well as like being ADCC and P world champions as well, gives them the number one spot. Yeah, that's the top level. Yeah. Uh, also, we kept, I mean, it's probably unfair now to say actually their G achievement would wait massively, but just the fact that, because we said we're going to keep this to no gi guys, yeah. I do think like the fact that they do both is super commendable. And I'll always probably give an edge to people who do both rather than just start singular. That's why, you know, for me, I'll have Roger over Gordon in the GOAT discussion because Roger did it all. Did it no gi, did it gi, did it MMA, you know. Uh, Cade, I wait to have his first MMA fight apparently as well. So that, uh, I think, like, just to add another string to their but that martial artist mentality that they seem to have yeah they're pretty confident their jiu jitsu is going to work in every different scenario not like funneling their matches into certain rule sets certain uh, like time periods as well so yeah. who might do that you can uh, guess for yourself okay so if you agree or disagree with what we uh, said there please let us know uh, leave a comment Um if you disagree with our rankings, if you think the Ryan shouldn't be ahead of the Rotolos, give us a reason as to why. And if you can identify any other reasons why you think the Rotolos are so exceptional, please let us know. Because 
Uh, the reason why I like watching them is because I think it can help me my jiu-jitsu better, not just in terms of the uh, specific interactions that they do, because you know I am not the grappler that they are, so I'm never going to be able to play on it. The, the the speed level etc that they do and their their uh, bodies allow them to do different things than it possible for me but I think like if you can think of any other reasons why they might not have that success let us know because it's something to look for yeah I was just uh, like you were saying there like looking at specific scenarios it just made me think a lot of people were looking at that sequence uh, between Ty and Isaac where you hit that switch into that Scissor sweep, and a lot of people, I think, were kind of like looking at that and breaking that down and trying to hit that specifically. But I think that's them just having like good fundamental movements, like basic movements, like a switch is like a nice fundamental movement. Same with like a, a scissor sweep, and they're just at that level where they can just put those kind of things together in like split seconds rather than like, well, oh, I'm going to specifically try to hit that. Just like have good basic movements and it'll start to come together. And I absolutely love seeing some classic Jiu Jitsu, be it a closed guard from Mika. Or a scissor sweep from Thai being used by a young dynamic athlete who can do just about anything, anything that's happening in jiu-jitsu, any technique that's off the moment, they can do. But and they're often the ones coming up with it. But at their core, they have absolute <laughs> fundamental classic jiu-jitsu that will never die, never go out of fashion. It's always beautiful to see that in a match. Yeah. Okay, so that concludes our episode where we are focusing on, focusing on the Rotolos. We'll be back again soon with another Jiu-Jitsu Oracle. A couple of big events to look out for that are coming up soon. There's a huge number one early in May that has some of the guys that we've mentioned on the pod competing. Nicky Ryan's got a match and Tiger's got a match. There's the Brasileiro happening in the key. And then that's going to lead in to the World Championships from the IBGJF. So plenty of action coming up. Like, subscribe, follow so you can see when another edition of the Jiu-Jitsu Oracle lands.